financial disclosures. Uh, I am entirely supported by asbestos manufacturers and their insurance companies. Uh, uh, they send lots of money to my clients and I get some of that. Um, so, uh, uh, Jim, you can put that down on the book. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, money, uh, asbestos bankruptcy trusts uh, in the United States, how they operate. Uh, and the implications of that, not only for Americans, but for asbestos victims around the world. Uh, after some of the presentations uh, here that have dealt with a lot of the, uh, the social and emotional issues involved, uh, this is pretty dull, uh, but it may uh, help folks as, as they plan in other countries uh, for how to deal with with funds, how to deal with compensation. Uh, the asbestos bankruptcy uh, trust funds uh, are uh, fairly complex. Uh, here's a list of some of the major ones. And by the way, don't worry about uh, taking notes or trying to take photos or anything of the slides. Uh, first, it's not that interesting. Second, uh, I've got uh, copies online and I'll give you the link at, on my last slide. So you're welcome to go download this whole uh, presentation. Uh, the asbestos bankruptcy trust industry, if I can call it that, uh, started in 1982 with the first asbestos bankruptcies. And we've been through waves of them over the years. Uh, there are now somewhere around 50 trust funds that have been established. Uh, they were established as a result of litigation uh, we sued enough companies often enough and beat them badly enough uh, that many of them decided uh, they were no longer solvent. Uh, many of them decided they would like to go hide, uh, pay the bills and move on with their lives. Uh, and uh, as the process began, the lawyers representing the, the patients, uh, the victims, uh, technically the plaintiffs, uh, began to work together not only to build the cases, but also uh, to create templates uh, so that uh, we could have a coherent approach. Uh, right now, the major trusts have quarterly meetings, and at, at my instance, after I got tired running around the country on this random schedule, um, we now meet four times a year for two to three days. Uh, the trusts meet uh, anywhere between 15 minutes and an hour back to back uh, it got so tedious, I decided that the only way to make this tolerable is we now call it Trust Fest, um, so we can pretend we're having a good time. Uh, the, the, uh, in, in a nutshell, the U.S. bankruptcy trusts have to date, uh, hello? Uh, paid out already over $21 billion uh, to the claimants uh, since they began. Now, some of these trusts have been in operation since the 1980s. Some went to the business uh, to operation, you know, three months ago. Uh, uh, we've cr put together a list of assets uh, of the trusts, and this is a pretty daunting task, digging through public records of what they file with the courts. It's, it's accurate uh, as of the end of last year because this year's reports aren't in and the information I have about actual current numbers uh, comes uh, confidentially. Uh, I've been involved in the reorganization of almost all of these asbestos companies when they file for bankruptcy by serving on victims committees in the bankruptcy courts often uh, as the co-chair or chair of those committees. And when these trusts are established, the courts appoint uh, a committee of a trust, a trust the victim representatives uh, as advisors to the trusts. And uh, I and my firm serve on virtually all of those. Uh, actually, the Wall Street Journal published a list uh, accusing me of being involved in more trusts with more money than any other American lawyer. Um, as a result, I have now advertise uh, widely 
that the Wall Street Journal has proclaimed me America's most important bankruptcy trust lawyer, uh, because if they're going to slander me, I might as well have some fun with it. Uh, the trust's current assets are close to $32 billion, uh, and this is money that is set aside to be paid out over the next 30 or 40 years. Every trust does projections on its claims in the future, and generally they all assume that by 2049 or so, um, there won't be any more asbestos claims. Uh, while they're holding the money, they of course are investing it, and so although this, this is $32 billion, the trusts generally are earning about a 5% annual return on their investments, uh, so this money grows, they spend it. There are some trusts that pay claims so slowly and make so much money uh, on their uh, assets that I've suggested to them that they're among the best businesses in the country. We ought to just go public and sell stock, uh, but which kind of embarrasses them enough that they start paying. Um, I'm talk, going to talk about mesothelioma cases because that's where the bulk of the trust money goes and that's uh, the biggest... Uh, issue. This is a very hard to read table uh, that lists every major trust uh, and each trust pays a percentage of the value of the claims. Uh, these are unique numbers for each trust which uh, is created by uh, counting up the money that they have, projecting what they're going to make in the future, counting up the number of claims they're sitting on, as well as the ones that the statisticians predict they'll have in the future, valuing those, and then dividing the assets by the liabilities to get a percentage. And we're constantly reviewing these numbers because you can never actually get it right when you try to predict the future. Uh, but uh, I've given you here uh, the values for the mesothelioma cases as currently as uh, a week or two ago when some trusts changed their percentages. And what this suggests is that if somebody had a claim against every one of these trusts, and I'll explain to you what that means later, but basically they, that you were exposed to their products, um, these trusts would value your claim at uh, almost $6 million, but then by applying the payment percentage, you would get paid $924 million. Uh, uh, thousand, that's right, okay. Uh, they also have average values because you can have individual review and other than routine claims, uh, the totals there are a little different and you would actually collect about a million and a half dollars. Now, nobody <coughs> in the world uh, has ever had a claim or a legitimate claim against every one of these companies because you would have had to work uh, in every trade, in every geographic area of the country with some significant exposure. So to put this in a more realistic uh, context, I pulled out, for example, the companies and trusts that a typical shipyard worker would have, and uh, in essence, that would pay off about $200,000 total uh, the average claim value, which would be higher, is about 250000 I also took a look at typical construction workers, somebody who worked in the building and construction trades uh, as a career, and looked at the company's trust that they would have a claim against, and uh, the scheduled minimum value that they would get would be about $200,000. Uh, the average of individually examined claims would be about $260,000. Uh, now, to make a claim, you have to have, have worked with uh, or around the products of that company. Uh, we've moved away from the aggressive litigation system that we still follow in the courts uh, to a more rational administrative structure here and trust uh, inherits the books and records and, and litigation experience of the company whose claims it's going to pay. And we now get to look uh, at the inside of that data. We go through it and th these companies knew where they sold their products. Uh, they knew who used them. And so we have the trust put together uh, what we call site lists of places where the trust says 
you know, we know we were there. So if you worked in that shipyard at that refinery during the years when our product was there, you don't have to prove that we were there. We admit that we were there. Now just show us uh, what your trade was and show us that you're sick. And uh, this is obviously heavily weighted to the United States. Uh, there are over 115,000 identified sites. Now that doesn't mean they're all different. It means that it's a total of all the sites different trusts identified. So almost everybody will say that, that they were at a particular shipyard that, and that one shipyard may be on 20 or 30 work sites. The trusts have also identified over 3,000 foreign sites. Uh, uh, we consider Canada to be America, by the way, so Canada is included in the first list. They also have uh, lists of approved ships, uh, and these are, of course, much more relevant uh, to foreign claimants because one of the things about ships is, with luck, they move around. There are over 19,000 specific ships that have been identified on somebody's site list, uh, largely on the site lists of companies who made boilers, and I'm going to talk about that as an interesting example in just a minute. Um, this is a boiler manufactured by Babcock and Wilcox Company. Okay, you can see in the lower left-hand corner a yellow hat. Uh, that's a worker in a hard hat. That gives you some idea of the scale of the boiler. Um, one of the nice things about boilers is that once you build them and install them, they're really hard to move. Uh, and so if a boiler goes into a work site in 1930 and the building still exists, the boiler is still probably there. The exception to this rule is if you put the boiler in the bottom of a ship, um, it goes around with the ship all over the place. It still stays on the ship but at least it means if that ship goes to a foreign port and is worked on by foreign workers, uh, there can be exposure to an American-made boiler uh, overseas. Uh, this is the, the home page of the uh, Babcock and Wilcox or B&W uh, Bankruptcy Trust Fund. Uh, B&W alone admits to 2,700 foreign sites and over 8,000 specific ships that had their boilers on them. Uh, if you go to the home page, you can access information on everything that's relevant. Uh, it tells you how to file a claim, resources that you might want to use, how to understand what they mean when they tell you there's something wrong with your claim, frequently asked questions, there's a tutorial that guides you through everything. Uh, and each trust functions based on a document called the Trust Distribution Procedure Manual. Uh, we have made these essentially uniform uh, across all the trusts. So once you look at one, with minimal exceptions, you now understand how to handle claims against any trust. Uh, this is the B&W uh, value schedule for all uh, as asbestos claims. You can see that uh, uh, mesothelioma uh, cases have a scheduled or standard value of 90000 The trust strives to have an overall average value of its meso claims of 120000 By comparison, uh, plural black cases are valued at $5,000. Um, you know, so you can see that the bulk of the assets here uh, are devoted to mesothelioma cases. And for foreign claims, as we'll discuss in a minute, they're really the only claims that are worth considering bringing to an American trust. Uh, foreign claims are individually reviewed uh, and are valued uh, under that process. These are pages from that distribution process. The document is online. Uh, the foreign claim, uh, as I said, involves anybody who lives outside the United States and Canada whose exposure was outside the United States and Canada. The claims are valued under the law of the home jurisdiction, uh, both under the, under the rules of, of that local law and valued the way they would be in the, in the local court. I will 
jump through some of this. You have to prove a claim by showing exposure to the product. Um, and I've given two to three hour seminars on how to do claims for foreign workers uh, in foreign shipyards. I've done webinars for union groups. Uh, it's, it's not that complicated a process. Uh, this is a list of trust websites. Uh, the uh, the end, and if you have questions, you're more than welcome to write to me. That's my email address. Uh, the slides are available on our website as of now. Uh, you have, they're secret. You can't find them uh, unless you do the slash I think 2014. That will bring you to a downloadable PDF, and you're welcome to make copies and sell them to all your friends. Um, I have May's picture there. She works with me on processing bankruptcy claims. Uh, I end my sermon about bankruptcy claims uh, and foreign uh, cases by saying that um, there is absolutely no reason for any, uh, any organization, any group, uh, to um, hire American lawyers to do these. Uh, all you need is facility in English, uh, English documents, because the trusts require you to submit them in England, in English. Uh, and the answers to all questions that one might need are available on the trust websites. Uh, and the indispensable research tool is, of course, the great god Google. Uh, from which you can find all necessary information. Uh, I encourage everybody not to use American lawyers, but to do them locally. Uh, and as I've said before, if you really feel the need to hire American lawyers, for God's sake, don't hire anybody but me. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Chairman the back there has a question, and then Sophie here at the end has a question as well. Chairman, please. Thanks for the illuminating talk, Stephen. Um, I just want to know, of that $120,000, how much does the patient see? Well, it depends on the payment percentage of the trust, and I, I said you multiply that, and I, I don't remember what the B&W payment percentage is, but uh, if it's, uh, you know, just figure it out. Some trusts pay 1%, a couple pay 100% for strange reasons. Typically it runs 15, 20, 30% is the total value that is paid by the trust. Uh, in the United States, these cases are typically handled on a contingency fee basis. Uh, the earliest bankruptcies, in the Johns Manville bankruptcy, the court had a hearing. Uh, the judge didn't like how much lawyers got paid and he determined that the appropriate fee for these cases would be 25%. Um, I always try to get other trusts to, uh, to adopt that rule. When I tell my colleagues at the plaintiff's bar at these meetings that we should do what that judge said, uh, lawyers usually tell me that uh, you know, they're gonna charge as much as they can, um, and just because the client is getting, so you take a haircut on how much they make, I usually say because it's the right thing to do and then I get very puzzled looks uh, from people who sort of don't understand that concept. But basically that's the way it works. Almost everybody in the U.S. who has bankruptcy claims will also have claims against civil defendants. Um, so the, the documents and everything needed to, to uh, process a claim arise from that part of the case uh, so there usually aren't a lot of outside costs in a bankruptcy claim. Uh, they, they tend to be, you know, a couple percent of the total, perhaps. Uh, so, you know, in my hands, uh, the client gets 75% of whatever the trusts pay, and we do all the claims that they can legitimately file. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this is the amount of money boggles the mind. I can't get my head around those billions. But um, I really would like to understand how much of that money 
would be allocated to some kind of community outreach, you know, because in the asbestos relief trust we have got 10%, and then secondly, how much of it would go towards research? Well, the answer is easy, and it is the same, uh, zero. Uh, these are individual claims, the money goes to the claimants, who then pay their lawyers and use the money for whatever people use money for. There is no uh, organized uh, structure uh, that channels any of that money to any public uh, use. Now, having said that, for example, in our firm, uh, we invite and encourage our clients to support medical research in particular uh, and work with them that, so if they want to contribute, uh, we essentially contribute as well. Uh, and uh, I can't offhand, probably three or four million dollars uh, over the years, uh, over the last 10 years perhaps, has come from our firm uh, to support research on mesothelioma. But that's us and very few other people do that sort of thing. Uh, Thank you, Steve.